Good evening. To some, they're the scourge of the roads. To others, a smart solution to getting round the capital. But today, Transport for London stripped Uber of their licence over fears the taxi hailing company isn't vetting its drivers properly, putting passenger safety at risk. It's been revealed 14,000 journeys were completed by uninsured drivers, uploading their photos to exploit the app. Uber said the decision was extraordinary and wrong and they are appealing. Our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. For your safety, we kindly ask you to please fasten your seatbelt. Uber is trying hard to create the right impression. Please keep your mobile phone switched on at all times so you can follow your trip and find out all about your driver. But behind the slick advert, there's something rotten. At least that's the view of Transport for London, which today declared Uber was not fit and proper to hold a private hire operator licence. TfL claims to have uncovered multiple breaches of safety rules, including thousands of journeys where uninsured drivers were able to pick up passengers after exploiting flaws in Uber's software. At least 14,000 occasions where somebody may have been using an Uber, but the driver driving them isn't the person they thought it was. So these are unauthorised drivers manipulating Uber's app to drive people around uh, London when they shouldn't be doing so. Uber admits some drivers were breaking the rules, but the problem was dealt with. 43 drivers uh, were exchanging photos with a friend uh, in order to allow uh, other people to drive on, on the app. And this is something that we discovered and informed TfL of in May this year. Uh, as soon as we discovered it, we informed TfL, we put in place technical fixes to make sure that it couldn't happen again. Uber has revolutionised the minicab industry and made many drivers of traditional black taxis see red. Amjad Ali, originally from Afghanistan, has been an Uber driver for four years. TfL's decision to refuse a licence came as a shock. I think it's wrong because, you know, we are doing the public service. We provide the public service. Uber's ride-hailing app was groundbreaking when it was launched in London in 2012, but the market is becoming increasingly crowded. Mariusz Zabriotsky runs a French-owned rival, Captain, which has recruited many Uber drivers. Currently we have almost 20,000 drivers and most of them actually either uh, drive in the past or currently are driving for Uber. Ride hailing is here to stay, isn't it? Uh, it is, yes. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, over the last 10 years since we've been operating initially as Halo, uh, then through now to be free now, you know, we have seen the industry evolve and uh, you know, people want the convenience of a, of a cab uh, as soon as they open their smartphone. So, yes, I think it's here to stay. Uber said TfL's decision to refuse a licence was wrong and it plans to appeal, which means business as usual for drivers and passengers until the outcome of a court case. Simon, we've been here before, haven't we? Yeah, it's a familiar story for Uber's 3.5 million customers in London and around 45,000 drivers. It's more than two years since Uber was first stripped of its licence by TfL for not uh, d obeying the rules. That case went before a magistrate when Uber appealed and they got a new licence. But ever since, they've been on probation, as it were. And while TfL says there have been positive changes and improvements, the mayor says safety has to come first. Now, that next court case, if they appeal, which we expect them to, could be months away. So plenty of time, you might think, for Uber to get its act together and try to convince TfL it has mended its ways. But there's clearly still an issue there. OK, Simon, thank you very much. Good evening. Many issues have been debated in this election campaign, but today, for some communities in London, it became very personal. An intervention by the chief rabbi has provoked sadness and anger about Labour's handling of anti-Semitism. Ephraim Mervis accused Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn of allowing a poison sanctioned from the top. Mr Corbyn responded, saying anti-Semitism will not be tolerated. Our political correspondent Simon Harris has been talking to Jewish voters in North London. His fans wanted to serenade him, but the chorus of Oh Jeremy Corbyn was drowned out by reporters asking questions and protesters chanting. The Labour leader was in Tottenham to promote his party's race and faith policies. Instead, he was forced to publicly state what should be a given. There is no place whatsoever for anti-Semitism in our society, our country or in my party, and there never will be so long as I'm leader of the party. 
Mr Corbyn was responding to Britain's chief rabbi who told the Times a new poison sanctioned from the top has taken root in the Labour Party. It can no longer claim to be the party of equality and anti-racism. Be in no doubt the very soul of our nation is at stake. We feel worried, we feel perturbed and we don't understand why the leadership of the Labour Party is not dealing with the accusations of anti-Semitism in its midst. At JW3, a Jewish community centre in the North London suburb of Hampstead, the chief rabbi's intervention was the talk of the coffee shop. There are people here who know all too well what anti-Semitism is. London is very much a melting pot and it's acceptable, it's accepted if you are black, if you're accepted if you are gay, or whatever you are, it doesn't really matter, like I do. But if you're Jewish, you're seen with suspicion. We have security at all events and so forth. That, that is something that other religions don't necessarily have. JW3 is a community centre which prides itself on its open door policy. More than 4,000 people visit every week, not all of them Jewish. But that comes at a price. Half a million pounds a year, a quarter of JW3's budget is spent on security. Ben Paul, a blogger, was a lifelong Labour supporter. Not anymore. He thinks the party has been captured by an extreme cult. We're now politically homeless. And unless we speak out right now, we're going to lose our party forever. What can Mr Corbyn say or do in the next two weeks to reassure you? I think it's too late. Back in Tottenham, Lord Dubbs, a former London MP who's also Jewish, spoke up for the party. Today of all days, for the chief rabbi to be attacking the Labour Party in this particular way and attacking our leader is unjustified and unfair, and I am bitterly, bitterly disappointed that he's done that. If Mr Corbyn was bitterly disappointed, he didn't say so. Instead, he invited the chief rabbi to meet him. Simon is at West London Synagogue. So, Simon, what effect could this have on polling day? Well, first of all, Duncan, I don't think the symbolism of a prominent religious leader like the chief rabbi making such a dramatic intervention in a general election should be underestimated. And then let's not forget there are a handful of marginal constituencies in parts of North London with large Jewish communities which Labour must win if Jeremy Corbyn is to be the next Prime Minister. And that, according to the chief rabbi, is a prospect which causes genuine alarm among many Jewish voters. If nothing else, today's row drowned out Mr Corbyn's attempts to sell his party's policies on tolerance and equality. But Labour wasn't the only party criti criticised by faith leaders today. The Muslim Council of Britain called out the Conservatives, accusing the, Tories, the Tory party of tolerating Islamophobia. Simon, thank you. Now, to the upcoming general election, a new poll from YouGov suggests a convincing Tory majority and few seats changing hands here in the capital. Prospective MPs will be doing all they can in the next two weeks to try to convince voters. Tonight, we've chosen to focus on three of them. Our political correspondent Simon Harris is here. And Simon, three people standing for election for the very first time. Yes, two weeks today, the 2019 general election campaign will be over and voting will be underway. So it seemed like a good time to take the political temperature here in London. We invited three candidates to share their thoughts on the campaign so far. All of them hope to be in Parliament by Christmas. They may sit in different places on the political spectrum, but today they were happy to share a sofa. Nicola Horlick, Florence Eshalomi and Nikki Aiken are wannabe MPs in an era where politicians, especially women, increasingly find themselves the targets of abuse and hostility on social media. I don't do Twitter. I came off it after the last local elections in 2018 because I find it just too toxic. Did you think twice before standing? Did you talk to your family about it? The fact is I'm not going to be silenced into silence by anybody. I'm not going to be bullied into silence by anybody. Well, I've been surprised, actually, by not getting any abuse. I was expecting to get abuse, and so far, touch wood, I haven't had any. Nikki Aiken is the leader of Westminster Council and standing for the Conservatives in the cities of London and Westminster. Florence Eshalomi is a member of the London Assembly and is the Labour candidate in Vauxhall. And Nicola Horlick is best known as a city tycoon who's standing in Chelsea and Fulham for the Lib Dems. What makes a high-flying businesswoman with a lucrative career give it all up for, for politics? Well, in my case, it's because I'm so concerned about Brexit. The largest 
democratic vote in our country's history. And if we ignore that, we ignore no, our the, democracy the at our point, peril. It's not about ignoring it, democracy, Nick. It's about the fact that what people voted for in 2016 is not what the Conservatives exactly. are putting forward. People did not vote to be poorer. People did not vote for trade agreements to be broken. That's not people did not vote for poor working conditions. And they're not now. All of those things are what the Conservatives are offering. It's so absolutely clear. I'm sorry. Clear well, and also the possible breakup of the union. Of the We're going to have a border the down SMP, the Irish Sea. Because the SNP are hold, holding, holding the Labour Party. I'm guessing from the, to, from the discussion to, to, here that you, you, you all agree that this, this election is about Brexit. No, not necessarily. No, no it's not. How much is knife crime playing in this election? I hear what references is? to crime rather than knife crime and concern that there aren't enough police on the streets mm -hmm. and there's uh, and closing of police stations. What about all of you? You've got children. How worried are you about your kids? I, I'm more worried about my boys now. I used to worry more about my daughters than my sons. Mm -hmm. Now it's the other way around. I actually worry more about my Why? sons. Why? Because I think there is the possibility that they could suddenly be knifed on the street. And, and it seems to involve boys, all of this, far more than girls. So well, well, girls are getting more involved in it because these drug gangs uh, are so exploitative. They are, uh, they're very, very wise at what they do. It's an industry, and so all our children are at risk. Another thing which sometimes doesn't make the front of the news is the number of people who have been killed in terms of domestic violence yeah. by knife crime. That's gone up. A lot of women who are in vulnerable situations, really difficult relationships, are being killed at the hands of partners, abusive partners. Can I ask you about your own leaders? Um, what, what do you least like about Boris Johnson, Nikki? I'm not sure what I dislike about him. I don't know. I like him. I like the fact he wants to get things done. What do you least like about Joe Swinson? Um, I, I love Joe Swinson. I, I've known Joe very well for a long period of time and I've been actually even been up to Scotland and campaigned in her constituency in previous elections. And, and Flo, are you a big fan of Jeremy Corbyn? Jeremy's been out on the campaign trail with me um, when I was... Are you a fan? I am a fan. And at this stage, all of you, no regrets about throwing your hats in the ring? Nope, no, not no, none whatsoever. Well, Simon, lots of different views there, and I know lots more of that debate will be going up online for people to watch. Let's just go back to that poll. Polls don't always get it right. How significant is this one, though? First thing to say, the YouGov poll is just a snapshot of where we are now, so it comes with a health warning. But it's safe to say it's certainly spooked some of the parties. If it's accurate, it predicts Boris Johnson and the Conservatives will win the general election with a majority of 68. And here in London, just two seats would change hands. Kensington, where, the, uh, where Labour has a majority of just 20, would go to the Conservatives. And Richmond Park, where the Conservatives have a majority of 45, would switch to the Liberal Democrats. In the home counties, St Albans would change from Conservative to Liberal Democrat. But as we know, the polls have got it wrong in the past and there's still another two weeks to go. Oh, indeed. Simon, thank you.